Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Paul Miller. I'm the Associate Director of the Clemens Center for National Security. As many of you know, the Clemens Center exists to help train the next generation of national security leaders. Uh, in pursuit of that, this year we've hosted a series of speakers on Afghanistan. Uh, last semester, some of you were here when Dr. Thomas Barfield came to talk about Afghanistan before 9-11. Uh, turns out Afghanistan before 9-11 actually existed. It's amazing. Uh, we also hosted Steve Cole, the author of Ghost Wars, uh, and heard from him his thoughts on the current counterterrorism operations around the world and in South Asia. Uh, we're pleased to host today uh, Jeff Eggers, uh, but I do want to note for you that next week, on April 5th, uh, we're hosting Ambassador Syed Jawad. Uh, ambassador Jawad will be here. He has served as Afghanistan's ambassador to the United States for about seven years, uh, 2003 through 2010, and he's currently still serving as uh, a political and military advisor to the chief executive in Afghanistan. So we're, we're honored to host him. Please put that on your calendars. Uh, today we have uh, Jeff Eggers with us. Jeff uh, is a great addition to our speaker series on Afghanistan. He spent five years in the White House uh, working in the Obama administration. Uh, his final title was the Special Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs and Senior Director for Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, Jeff came to that position through the United States Navy. He served in the Navy for 20 years. Uh, he was a Navy SEAL. Uh, he left active service just in 2013. Thank you for your service. Uh, he, in his naval career, served as an advisor to General Stanley <laughs> Crystal, uh, also a Special Assistant to Admiral Mike Mullen, when Admiral Mullen was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So Jeff has a wealth of experience. Uh, he's a great addition to our speaker series. Please join me in welcoming Jeff Akers. Thanks, Paul. And it's great to be here. And thanks to the Clemens Center for hosting me and for the hospitality and getting here. I'm going to, uh, by way of explaining why I want to leave a, a lot of time for questions, um, really just make the case that I think, uh, as Paul is doing here, that it's uh, it's necessary that this this phase of asking hard questions about our experience in Afghanistan starts sooner rather than later. I think it's too early to really write the history. Uh, I'm not here to really kind of give any reveal of truth to you, uh, but I think it is time to begin the process and the journey of discovery and kind of starting to reconcile what this experience has meant over the last decade because it has been an, an incredibly difficult and costly chapter uh, in American foreign policy history. I left the White House after those five years, <clears throat> not because it was a difficult portfolio, although it was. I, I left in large part because uh, it was not conducive to my family's uh, kind of well-being. Um, I, I really got the hint when my daughter started saying things like, her favorite thing to do on Saturdays was to go to work with Dad. And, um, so that, that really kind of clicked it for me that it was time to go. But I decided that before I left, I really wanted to take my son uh, to work with me because it was the White House. And it was getting to the point where he could probably actually have a memory of this. He was, he was kind of in his upper twos. So I asked him one day, I said, his name is Eric, would, would you like to go uh, to the White House with Dad? And he got all excited. His eyes got really big, his smile got really wide, and I thought this is going to be a great hit. And so on one of these Saturdays before I left, we walked in, we got through security, and uh, I looked down at him and he was disappointed. He was looking around like, and by the time I knelt down and asked him, you know, Eric, what's wrong? He was crying. He was literally crying. And I said, Eric, what's wrong? I thought he wanted to go to the White House with that. And it turns out we had a giant misunderstanding, because the entire time I had been saying, do you want to go to the White House with Dad? He had been thinking I was saying, we want to go to a lighthouse. <laughs> <laughs> and I tell that story as a way of kind of giving people who work at the White House a little bit of uh, grounding and humility about, as special as it is, uh, my two-year-old was really disappointed that we were at the White House. To frame the talk today, what I, I thought I would do is break uh, the President's uh, eight years, soon to be eight years, uh, of experience on Afghanistan into three pieces, and then talk about six personal lessons that I've begun to wrestle with, and then really try to close by giving some sort of sense of what this means in terms of his overall legacy and whether or not that should be viewed favorably. 
The first phase was uh, really for me 2009, the president's first year in office. And it was the, the phase of developing the strategy. And it started out fairly rough with kind of a rhetorical <coughs> strategy and finally ended up after a lot of work and painful uh, process into a substantive strategy. Everybody knows that the President's first act on day one in terms of national security and foreign policy was the executive order on Guantanamo. Lesser known is his second day executive order, which was to order a review on Afghanistan. And he brought in uh, Bruce Rydell, who Paul uh, does work, to do this review uh, as an outsider, in part because he had been the President's campaign advisor during the campaign. And Bruce Rydell finished the strategic review on Afghanistan in record time. Um, by some accounts, the first draft of this new strategy was completed in a matter of days, which is almost unheard of. And in large part, that's because it was already written. Um, it, was, it was essentially done during the campaign. And that allowed the president very quickly to give a speech in March of 2009 that was really a rhetorical strategy. And I'll get into why that I say that, because I think it took too many shortcuts. And then the president sent General McChrystal uh, out to relieve uh, General McKeon in Afghanistan. Commensurate with kind of ratcheting up attention on this, he wanted to kind of up the horsepower in Afghanistan. I went with General McChrystal in June of 2009, and General McChrystal's first thing was to do a 90-day review. And we wrote an assessment. I actually authored the assessment, and then the assessment leaked and appeared on the front page of the Washington Post and ignited a second policy review. And the, the president had not at all been anticipating that there was going to be two reviews. He thought he was done. He asked Rydell to write it. He gave a speech in March. He thought he was done. Um, so this this was, you know, frust I think, frustrating for the administration in some sense. And it led to a much larger policy speech in December of 2009 that the president gave at West Point, where he did two things uh, that seemed to be somewhat intentional. One, he authorized a troop of a troop surge of 30,000 troops, but as well, he put a timeline on that surge, right? And there, so there's a duality, um, and we'll get into that. The second phase, and you'll note these aren't divided equally into thirds, um, because I think that, that if you actually divide this substantively into thirds, it goes the first year, the second year, and then everything else. So the second phase was really the second year, and I call this if the first phase was setting the strategy, the second phase, 2010, was adjusting the strategy. And he did this in three major ways. One was he institutionalized the timeline, not just as a U.S. timeline, but as a NATO timeline. He went to a NATO summit in November of 2010 in Lisbon, where all the heads of state agreed that they were going to put this on a four-year clock, and that the process of transition would be done by the end of 2014. The second thing they did was they committed to a strategic partnership with Afghanistan, which was something of a way of counterbalancing the timeline, right? because anxious were, Afghans were becoming anxious about a four-year timeline. So this was to say, we're going to stick with you beyond that. The security transition will be done in four years, but the economic transition is going to take much longer, so we're going to stay with you beyond that. And then the third major adjustment to the strategy was to take the idea of reconciliation, which is to promote a peace process inside Afghanistan, a political process with the Taliban, and take that from being a footnote on the strategy to making it uh, something that was far more prominent. And unfortunately, the reason for that was that there started to become some doubts about the, the capabilities and the, the outlook of the military strategy. And that really is uh, what defined the third phase. And the third phase was everything after 2011 until now, which was really a series of delays and extensions to the strategy itself. And this phase really started with the death of bin Laden in uh, the summer of 2011. And every decision that the president made after that was to make a conservative uh, delay or extension of the resourcing of the campaign to give it more time. Almost every review we did after that point was a request from the military to, to slow down the, the transition process, to slow down the withdrawal, and to give the campaign a little bit more time. So each decision was, was basically another version of that. What was supposed to be a very gradual reduction from the surge uh, strength of 100,000 troops down to zero over four years became what we call a waterfall, not, not gradual at all, a backloaded reduction of troops, uh, not to zero, but to 10,000 over six years. And that occurred in uh, about four major chunks, the most recent of which was when the president made the decision last fall that he was going to not make any further reductions below 10,000 and essentially leave that to his success, successor. Um, 
So those are the three phases. Now let me go through what I characterize as being uh, six lessons. And these by no means are the exhaustive six. These are the ones that are on the, the, the top of my mind right now as I work through uh, reconciling. But the first is where I started in 2009 in the Rydell Review, and that is the perils of taking shortcuts in developing strategy. In the military, we have a, an oversimplified way of talking about strategy that is the coherent arrangement of ends, ways, and means. And if you don't have that, you can't articulate that, then you don't really have a strategy. And the Rydell Review didn't really yield a coherent arrangement of ends, ways, and means. And I'll give you some examples. Um, on the ends, or the objectives, there was a problem with kind of carrying over these rhetorical aspirational goals that were, in some sense, uh, either unnecessary or unattainable. And probably the most uh, interesting was this idea that we were going to defeat the Taliban. And when McChrystal was doing his review that fall, when it started to become uh, a bit tense that, that McChrystal was, was hinting that more resources required, and the White House had thought that it had already paid the resource bill under the Rydell Review, one of the things we did, um, when I was in Afghanistan at the time, the night before one of these National Security Council meetings, is Stan asked me to create a graphic that showed what the Rydell Review said the objectives in Afghanistan were, and to really highlight this for the decision makers. And so we made a graphic that put at the very top these nested objectives, but it started with defeat the Taliban. And this, this graphic became kind of the centerpiece in the sit room of this meeting, and Secretary Gates at one point seized on it, and he asked the question, is it really necessary to defeat the Taliban? Should that be our objective? And out of that meeting came a decision to, frankly, downgrade uh, the, the objective to what the verb became, degrade, to degrade the Taliban. And then the strategy changed. It was no longer a military defeat of the Taliban. It was to degrade the Taliban, create the space and time to build up an Afghan army that, that you could then hand security responsibilities to. Um, so that was one example of where the Rydell Review really just kind of didn't really scrutinize the objectives carefully enough and things had to be revised in the McChrystal Review. But the second one is this idea, and it's more complicated, but this idea that we developed that we couldn't have any safe havens. Um, we called it the idea of zero safe havens, and that the United States after 9-11 had to go and stabilize and make well-governed every fragile or failing state around the world. Afghanistan was uh, first on the list, of course. And, and this led to the assumption that, that the strategy of, of defeating al-Qaeda involved eliminating all safe havens, which meant that Afghanistan needed to be well governed. And as we've seen in recent times, the idea that Brussels today can be something of a safe haven 